as Dave said, for the last uh, two years, I've been on sabbatical from legal practice as the New Zealand Law Foundation International Research Fellow to Karahipi Rangahau Atayo, which I'm honoured to say is New Zealand's premier legal research award. The research topic was what does a world leading framework of charities law look like? And the final report focus on purpose was released on 19 April. I'm very grateful to the New Zealand Law Foundation and to the many, many others who have supported this work not least because it says that the charitable sector matters and it is worth taking the time to try to get the legal framework for charities right. If you made a submission to the government's review or you may find yourself quoted or cited in the report, the submissions are a rich source of information as to how the current framework of charities law is working on the ground and I have very much tried to amplify the submissions in the report. The report is 596 pages long, it's book length, and I make no apologies for that. The push to distill complex issues into easily digestible sound bites do charities an enormous disservice, in my view, and contribute to their being overlooked, undervalued, misunderstood, treated in isolation, or simply dismissed with a once-over lightly. Yet, the issues involved in this area of law go to the heart of the type of society we want to live in. It is critical, in my view, to get the legal framework for charities right. If you've had a chance to have a look at the report, you'll see that Chapter 9 contains a draft bill that would amend and restate the Charities Act. The first thing I did after all the work and consultation that Dave and I had done was put all my ideas in a draft bill um, and circulated that for consultation, basically as a starting point. And thank you very much to Andrew Eccleston and, and the many others who commented on the bill. And the Chapter 9 is the uh, outcome after all the comments that we received. Commentary to the draft bill is contained in Chapter 8, and Chapters 1 to 7 provide the basis on which the various recommendations have been made. I know how busy everyone is, but if you haven't already, I would encourage you to read the report, nevertheless, because charities are worth it. Uh, charities law can be contentious. Um, I anticipate a robust discussion, and I genuinely don't mind if you disagree with me. In fact, I welcome it. I passionately believe and freedom of expression, and that in a liberal democracy, it's through the discussion and the debate that we get better results. So please don't hold back. Um, the report makes 70 recommendations for charities law reform in Aotearoa, New Zealand, including that the government's review of the Charities Act is transferred to the Law Commission for an independent and ideally multidisciplinary review, taking into account issues of concern for the charitable sector, including the definition of charitable purpose, advocacy, agency structure, the wider legal framework and government contracting. If the Law Commission is not available, other jurisdictions such as Australia, Northern Ireland and England and Wales have adopted the independent panel model, which I note New Zealand has recently done itself for electoral law. We also strongly recommended recommendation 8.37 that no further piecemeal amendments are made to legislation affecting charities in advance of such an independent first principles review. I genuinely believe that further piecemeal reform entailing alterations to isolated aspects of an interconnected system while not addressing fundamental principles or key areas of concern will not achieve any benefits for New Zealand communities and is more likely to act perversely to preclude the real issues from being addressed. Um, we, half an hour is, is quite a, a short period of time and we won't have time to work through the whole report, but. I thought it might be helpful to draw your attention to some links. Uh, the report itself is on the New Zealand Law Foundation website. The Charity Law Association of Australia and New Zealand very kindly hosted a webinar last month, and there's a link to the webinar there. We collaborated with Huia uh, Community Aotearoa last year to present a webinar on charities law reform why it matters. So I've put a link to that uh, recording there. Ros Rice from Collaborative Voices and Community Networks Aotearoa recorded a discussion about the research. Um, there's a link to the recording there. Business Desk, you will have noticed, are doing a project about charities and they've published a couple of articles about the research. Also, RNZ did a short piece about the research, which can be found there. Um, CharitiesLawReform.nz is a website dedicated to the research and there's a facility there to sign up for updates. We also have a LinkedIn group and a Facebook page, um, which you're very welcome to join. I would also like to draw your attention to this article here from last year about uh, Confucius Institutes. Oops. Here we go. I would like to start with this quote um, by Sir Stuart Etherington, the former chief executive of the National Council of Voluntary Organisations, which is a key umbrella body for charities in the UK. 
He points out that civil society is essential to building a strong society and economy. And I believe that all of us, regardless of political persuasion, should passionately, explicitly, and unashamedly support people getting involved in their community, coming together, doing things for the wider public benefit, not simply for private gain. It is charity and volunteering that allow people to find identity, meaning and purpose, a sense of autonomy, pride and utility. It's often how we find balance in our lives, pursue our passions or fight for change. And for society at large, it is often how we build stronger communities, give people a say in what happens to them. It's how we provide services that people depend on, develop new ways of doing things and nurture the people who will lead our future. However, the current legal framework in New Zealand is in many ways acting as a barrier. We need systemic change to enable the charitable sector to reach its potential. It is important to consider civil society in context. In Western literature, society is often thought of as having three distinct sectors with family occupying a space in between. This third sector at the bottom has many names, tangata whenua, community and voluntary, NGO, non-profit, for-purpose, civil society, etc. And the lack of agreement on what to call the sector is arguably a reflection of the diversity of the sector itself and something to be celebrated and embraced rather than resolved. While the sector can appear messy and inefficient, in reality, this can be one of its strengths. But a key factor that unites entities in this sector is that they are all subject to a non-distribution constraint. That is, they are prohibited by their constituting document or governing legislation from distributing profits or surplus income to any individual. In other words, the sector is comprised of not for-profit entities. The non-distribution constraint is the key factor that distinguishes the not-for-profit sector from the business sector. But whatever the wider sector is called, the charitable sector is a subset of it. And one way of thinking of the distinction between the sectors is that the business sector is private organisations operating for private purposes. The government sector is public organisations operating for public purposes. And the charitable sector is private organisations operating for public purposes. Even by traditional measures, the charitable sector is significant with $68 billion of assets under management and annual income exceeding $21 billion, representing approximately 6.2% of New Zealand's GDP. But its contribution is even more significant when the sector's wider and tangible benefits are taken into account, such as its contribution to social cohesion, social capital and well-being. It is very important to protect the boundary between the not-for-profit sector and government. As the Law Commission noted in its Incorporated Societies report, not-for-profit entities are fundamentally private organisations that should be free from inappropriate government interference. This principle has been enshrined in Section 3.1.D.3 of the new Incorporated Societies Act, but it applies to all not-for-profit entities, including charities. Charities have a proud tradition of catalyzing much needed social change, of incubating innovative solutions to intractable problems and reaching into communities in ways that governments cannot, free from the dictates of the median voter or profit seeking shareholders. It is very important that we protect the independence of the charitable sector, or we will lose that which makes it distinctive and valuable to begin with. The Minister for the Community and Voluntary Sector has recognised the importance of creating an enabling framework for social enterprise. Uh, she notes that, I, that the government recognises the unique and value and powerful potential of the social enterprise sector. Complex social and environmental challenges cannot be solved by government alone. Increased wellbeing and prosperity benefits can be amplified by encouraging the social sector to grow. Given the economic challenges posed by COVID-19, it's now even more vital to increase social enterprise activity. We can lead the world by example. But the government appears to have overlooked the fact that charities running businesses are by definition social enterprises and that creating an, an enabling framework for charities is a critical part of creating an enabling framework for social enterprise in New Zealand. But sadly, the charitable sector is the invisible subcontinent on the social landscape of most countries, poorly understood by policymakers and the public at large, often encumbered by unnecessary legal limitations and inadequately utilised as a mechanism for addressing public problems. There are a number of reasons for this. It's not widely known that the charities legislation in New Zealand was a response to the 9-11 terror attacks that occurred in the US in 2001. 
Following the attacks, a Financial Action Task Force, or FATF, was set up as a global money laundering and terrorist financing watchdog. FATF issued a series of eight special rec recommendations, and perhaps reflecting concern that training of the terrorist pilots had been funded through a US-based not-for-profit organization. Recommendation eight argued that not-for-profit organizations were particularly vulnerable to being abused for the financing of terrorism. FATF's interpretive note to recommendation eight stated that not-for-profit organizations may be vulnerable because they enjoy public trust, have access to considerable sources of funds, they may have a global presence that provides a framework for national and international operations and movements of funds, and they may be subject to little or no government oversight. FATF concluded, concluded that terrorist organizations have taken advantage of these characteristics to infiltrate the sector and misuse not-for-profit funds and operations to support terrorist activity. FATF recommendation eight was controversial. Its effect was to cast suspicion on the entire not-for-profit sector, despite an absence of any evidence suggesting the sector was in any way more likely to be exploited by terrorists than any other sector. However, Recommendation 8 changed government's attitude to independent civil society organisations, providing a rationale for a shift from benign registration regimes to active regulation with significant negative consequences. Recommendation 8 led to blunt, sector-wide increases in restrictions, which badly damaged the relationship and levels of trust between governments and civil society. Ironically, while the New Zealand government has imposed increasing regulatory control over charities through the Charities Act and other mechanisms, FATF has since acknowledged the negative effects of Recommendation 8 and revised it. Since then, the UN Special Rapporteur has called on FATF to improve its cooperation with civil society and embrace not-for-profit organisations as indispensable and integral to the solution in the fight against terrorism. The updated FATF recommendation reflects the need to protect the legitimate activities of not-for-profit organisations and no longer includes the wording. However, the damage was done. Following FATF Recommendation 8, there was a wave of charities legislation around the world, including in England, Wales, Australia, Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and New Zealand. There are no doubt others, but notable exceptions include the US, where the attacks occurred, and Canada. While a direct link between Recommendation 8 and this legislation is not clear in all cases, and just to be clear, I'm not suggesting that China's charity law is a direct response to 9-11. In the case of New Zealand and Ireland, it was pressure from the United Nations Security Council following 9-11 that led to specific legislation for charities. 9-11 spawned a counter-terrorism narrative that led to crackdowns on dissent and a shrinking space for civil society around the world. The first decade of the 21st century has witnessed a decreased tolerance for risk and an explosion of counter-terrorism me measures that prioritise security at the expense of democratic norms leading to a proliferation of government regulation and an increasing erosion of fundamental human rights. The overall impact on democracy of these measures has been profoundly negative. The number of democracies backsliding into authoritarianism has doubled in the past decade, exacerbated by restrictive measures adopted in response to the pandemic. According to the 2021 Civicus Monitor, 90%, nine out of every 10 people in the world is now living in a country rated as closed, repressed, or obstructed. Even Australia and much of Europe are rated as narrowed. The net effect is that charities legislation and its administration has become increasingly restrictive. Charities law frameworks are being used as a tool for suppression of not-for-profit advocacy. Civil society is operating in an increasingly hostile environment. Add to this forces at work trying to destabilize democracy from within, and this century is becoming a contest between liberal democracy and the forces of autocracy. China has expansionist ambitions. It is aggressively expanding its authoritarian influence overseas, as we have seen in countries like Myanmar, Solomon Islands, the Philippines, Hong Kong, etc. It may use education in this regard, and I was very surprised in carrying out the research at how many people, particularly young people, we're questioning whether freedom of expression, even democracy, were things worth having. And that's why I've included the article, and I'd be um, very interested in your thoughts on it. In times of uncertainty, people innately look for strong leadership. But what we really need are strong communities. The best way to protect against increasing polarisation and extremism is to bolster the bonds of community and democracy. 
social cohesion is critical to preventing the development of harmful radicalizing ideologies, to strengthening resilience to the narratives of hate and division, and thus to presenting, preventing downstream violent extremism. It is often said that much like a virus, disinformation spreads through susceptible hosts. Democratic principles act as a vaccine to the hateful and racist ideologies that are dedicated to destabilizing democratic principles and destroying such norms. And in a country like New Zealand, with a focus on well-being and bolstering social cohesion, et cetera, we do have the opportunity to be world leading in designing our charities law framework in the face of all these competing forces. In my view, a world leading framework of charities law would boldly uphold liberal democratic values of social tolerance, freedom of expression, freedom of association, and the rule of law. It would recognize charities' important role in the liberal democracy and protect their independence, and particularly their ab ability to advocate fearlessly for their charitable purposes. The price of peace is eternal vigilance. And I think if we value living in a democracy, we're going to have to stand up for it. Now, I have got more material here than I could fit into half an hour. So Simon, just let me know when I need to stop. So I'm probably going to go quite quickly over the next few slides. But as Dave um, mentioned, um, the Charities Bill um, that was introduced in 2004 was widely regard, regarded to be fundamentally flawed. And what I'd like to do is, is compare how the government's review of the Charities Act measures up against the uh, imperative to uphold liberal democracy. It's important to note that prior to the Charities Act, charities in New Zealand enjoyed high levels of public trust and confidence. In other words, public trust and confidence in charities does not derive from the Act. The problem the Charities Act originally sought to address was a lack of information. In those days, with no register of charities, anyone could stand on a street corner and rattle a bucket, and you wouldn't know if the person was actually acting for a charity, you wouldn't know if the charity was legitimate, and you most importantly, you wouldn't know what happened to the money. But um, sadly, because of the process through which the Charities Bill went through, the Charities Act has passed is replete with unintended consequences. These are some of the worst offenders, but there are many others. And to make matters worse, the 18 years since the Charities Act was passed have been characterised by a series of piecemeal amendments that have similarly been rushed through under urgency without proper consultation, often against the strong opposition of this charitable sector. Um, we now have a piece of legislation that is full of unintended consequences and much in need of a proper post-implementation review. As many have noted, there has been a slow moving change of underlying uh, paradigm, particularly since the Charities Commission was disestablished and its functions transferred to a business unit within the Department of Internal Affairs in 2012. The gains that charities made during the Select Committee period in 2004 have been slowly eroded like a frog in boiling water. Perhaps the most notable of these is the disestablishment of, of the Charities Commission in 2012. The hastily made changes grafted onto the original Charities Commission framework, an unusual bipartite decision-making regime that appears to have been based on a significantly watered down version of the Gambling Commission, which I note is also administered by DIA. I would encourage you to read chapter seven of the report in particular and draw your own conclusions as to whether the current bipartite structure of charity services and the Charities Registration Board is fit for purpose. One of the key difficulties is that when the Charities Commission was disestablished, all of the accountability mechanisms provided by the Crown Entities Act were correspondingly removed. Charity services is subject to almost no meaningful accountability mechanisms beyond minimal passing reference in a 200 page DIA report. And this was noted in submissions. A lot of uh, people commented on, on the lack of meaningful accountability. As one submitter put it, it's not appropriate for a government service to be responsible only to itself. Now, how has the slow moving change of paradigm uh, occurred? And it occurs deep in the detail of legal interpretations of the definition of charitable purpose. This is where charity services is particularly vulnerable. It is doing a lot of things that have really um, stretched the bounds of the rule of law. Um, undue reliance on cases from other jurisdictions without reference to the different statutory framework. Uh, and all the fact that that statutory framework has since changed. Key New Zealand case law has been overlooked. Uh, legal tests have been reworked. Um, wider indirect public benefits have been ignored. 
guidance, law, law is made through guidance rather than through a parliamentary process. And all of this is problematic because it has fundamentally shifted the underlying paradigm from one based on purposes to one based on activities, which has put New Zealand out of step with the rest of the world, the rest of the common law world on how our definition of charitable purpose is, uh, is interpreted. The net result is a very subjective, even arbitrary approach to um, whether any, any charity is eligible for registration. In 2017, um, after DIA tried unsuccessfully to remove uh, the vast bulk of charities' rights of appeal by a statutes amendment bill over the Christmas period without consultation, it then became Labour Party policy for the 2017 general election to consult with the sector on whether the disestablishment of the Charities Commission has improved things for the sector, to prioritise the long promised review of the Charities Act, beginning with a first principles review, including looking at the definition of charitable purpose, and ensure that uh, community and voluntary organisations can engage in advocacy without fear of losing government contracts or their charitable status. Now, this policy is significant because not one of these issues are being addressed by the current review. It was an attenuated review to start with, as Dave mentioned, but it's been a, a telescoped even further to just five issues. The proposals that were announced on 2 June 2022, and I've got a slide of those in case that might be helpful. And the minister has said that she wants a bill to be tabled in parliament later this year. The minister also says that the Charities Amendment Bill will mark the completion of a significant phase of work, a comprehensive review. But how can it be a comprehensive review when it's only looked at five issues and none of them are the ones that are of concern to the charitable sector, with the possible exception of the reporting requirements for small charities? And the minister also says that after taking action on these immediate changes, she will consider a process to address more fundamental issues raised in the review. But the minister is being advised by DIA. The DIA does not want a first principles review. They have fought us all the way. Um, and I imagine once they've done this review, they'll say they've done the review and there will, there will be no appetite for looking at fundamental issues of real concern for the charitable sector. And to make matters worse, uh, the work of the tax working group would indicate that uh, this charities amendment bill that they're proposing will be followed by very unhelpful tax changes, including potentially removing the exemption from income tax, um, not only for business income, but potentially for all income. So how am I doing for time? <laughs> um, I'll just carry on, but just let me know if I need to stop. You've got eight minutes. Eight minutes, okay, thank you. Well, I really think it's important to look at the work of the tax working group because um, it, um, it was tasked with considering whether New Zealand should introduce a capital gains tax. Its terms of reference were entirely silent on the topic of charities. Nevertheless, charities were considered at one meeting. Um, the agenda for the 6th July 2018 meeting revealed that one and a quarter hours were, be, were to be allocated to a discussion about charities, including consideration of a proposal from a scholarship winner to implement a charity credit account prior to removing the income tax exemptions for charities altogether. Officials prepared a background paper for the meeting focused on what officials described as the two most important tax policy matters for not-for-profits, private foundations, particularly donations, concessions available to foundations, and the business income of charities, concluding that accumulations of profits was an underlying issue for both. There does not appear to have been any consultation with the charitable sector in the preparation of this background paper or in the selection of these two issues as key. And there are also other um, matters that concern me about the work of the tax working group. There does not appear to have been any analysis in the work of the tax working group of the impact of the financial reporting rules for charities that were brought in in 2015. In, in addition, the existence of a competitive advantage of charities running businesses compared to their for-profit uh, counterparts was assumed rather than analyzed. But research indicates when that when the issue is analyzed, no competitive advantage is found to exist. Tax exemption merely compensates for the disadvantages charities otherwise face in their ability to raise capital. The tax working group material also does not mention the words social enterprise. And there appears to be a, an assumption in the tax working group material that accumulating funds is fundamentally inconsistent with public benefit. 
And the, but the net result is that charities appear to have received less than one and a quarter hours formal consideration during the entire tenure of the tax working group. The focus of that consideration appears to have been on the tax treatment of private foundations without any apparent analysis of the mechanisms already in place to address any issues raised. Charities have been treated as an afterthought. Yet the findings of the tax working group with respect to charities made their way directly to the review of the Charities Act and the Tax Policy Work Programme albeit identified as matters requiring further work. And there's a, a tax policy um, framework underlying the tax working group's analysis, which is called this tax expenditure analysis. I'd love to go into it if there was more time, but basically the way that they view charities is as a fiscal cost. They only look at the cost, the apparent cost of the tax exemption without looking at the benefits that charities provide and they ignore the fact that um, most jurisdictions do not tax the income of charities because there's no private benefit. They've overlooked the non-distribution constraint. Nobody can make a private profit out of a charity lawfully. And so on that basis, the tax privileges are not a, um, a concession, but they're merely just a proper adjustment of the tax base. But um, this tax expenditure analysis is permeating the approach of officials and advisors and ultimately the government on how charities are perceived and therefore regulated. Because uh, there is an underlying clash of paradigms in this area of law. Um, the tax expenditure analysis leads to a perception that charitable funds are somehow government funds over which government will feel entitled to exercise control. Um, so this paradigm sees charities as a fiscal cost or a service delivery arm of government. And interestingly, this is, I understand, the policy of the Chinese Communist Party in relation to its 2016 charity law, a policy which Mark Seidel describes as more third sector and less civil society. And this approach is based on a view of the charitable sector as purely service oriented, with a role limited to taking over service, social services from government. The other paradigm sees charities' independence as their hallmark and key to what makes them distinctive and valuable. Charities' independence from government enables them to take risks, experiment, innovate, and reach into, into communities in ways that government can, cannot. Charities are also untethered to electoral cycles, potentially enabling them to address issues on a longer-term basis than governments. Under this paradigm, charities are seen as the eyes, ears, and conscience of society, with a report, an important role in holding government to account. The independence of charities has been critical in many important societal changes that have been achieved over the centuries, including the abolition of slavery, universal suffrage, anti-smoking laws, and so many others. This paradigm sees charities' right to mana motahake or self-determination as an important manifestation of liberal democratic values. The diversity of the charitable sector allows people for authentic expressions of pluralism, democratization, and localism, as people come to agree, together to address issues they see arising in their community, which issues may not yet be on the radar of government. Many solutions are needed to the complex and connected challenges that we face. Government acknowledges that it cannot do everything. Communities know best what communities need. In other words, at the risk of oversimplification, one paradigm seeks to restrict charities and the other seeks to enable their work. This underlying clash of paradigms also manifests itself in the interpretation of the definition of charitable purpose. The narrow paradigm contributes to charities being seen as anachronistic, a deficits-based paternalistic colonialist concept of handouts to the poor, limited to assuaging need and therefore forced to wait until people have fallen off a cliff before being able to help them. This narrow paradigm contributes to charities being seen as symptoms of the problem rather than a key part of the solution. Yet, when the definition of charitable purpose is correctly interpreted in accordance with New Zealand law, it is not at all so limited. It is strengths-based, capable of embracing innovation, prevention rather than merely cure, and supporting human flourishing in all its many manifestations. The best illustration of this in New Zealand, in my view, is the trilogy of cases in the Latin litigation, which is why I have gone into some detail in the report in chapter three of the report on the factual background of that case, because it is quite a complex uh, factual background. And I wondered if that was contributing to the case being overlooked. So I've gone into some detail of it in the case. And it's important to note that a restrictive command and control paradigm is expensive, not only in terms of compliance, administration and litigation costs, but hidden costs 
such as damage to independence, goodwill, trust and confidence, and New Zealand's culture of volunteering. It's important to note that after 14 years and many millions of dollars worth of regulation, public trust and confidence in charities has in fact declined. Um, research indicates that public trust and confidence is not driven by regulation, it's driven by charities themselves, and in particular their purposes. Um, to the contrary, over-regulation aimed at the lowest common denominator can diminish trust and confidence by creating su suspicion that regulation must be needed when that may not in fact be the case. So I'm assuming that I'm out of time, but um, at the very least, I think it is necessary to be conscious, open and consultative about which paradigm is chosen and the reason why. And my concern is that um, they're not looking at the definition of charitable purpose, but the reasons for not doing so, I don't think hold. And they're looking, even though they're not going to look at that, they're going to codify charity services very narrow interpretation, which I think is a, an enormous mistake. And once that is in legislation, it'll be very difficult to ever turn around. These are the proposals that the minister has announced on 2 June. The ones in green, the two in green, I, I think will be helpful. They're proposing to extend the time frame from 20 working days to two months. I think that will be helpful. Um, the ones in yellow are the ones I'm really concerned about. And the ones that aren't coloured are, are kind of neutral. Like they, the last one at the bottom, at least one officer of a charity will need to be 18 years or older. And they're saying that there is not one charity in New Zealand that has any officers who are um, who doesn't have a, 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 at least one officer. So it's not exactly clear what problem they're trying to fix. But I think there's a, a perfect storm. Um, the funding government contracting environment is pitting charities against each other. Charities are very depleted. Charity services has reasonably unbridled power to determine the nature and scope of, of the charitable sector, but no meaningful accountability. Um, there's no one to speak up for the sector as a result of structural issues. And, and another problem is that the minister is usually brand new and usually outside cabinet. And I'm sure she was well-intentioned in making these changes, but there's no formal process for the charitable sector to provide context to DIA advice. So um, I'm very concerned that the, the, the proposals will not do anything to benefit New Zealand's community, and they are more likely to act perversely to preclude the real issues from being addressed. Even the DIA's own regulatory impact statement notes that there is an inadequate problem definition, definition inadequate consultation, and a lack of evidence to support the proposals. Uh, the report pr proposes to focus on purpose, um, to basically use the mechanisms that are already in the law uh, without trying to cut across them or create new mechanisms, but it's a fundamentally a, uh, an equitable uh, based area of law and a regulatory focus cuts across that almost completely. And the framework should be about accountability, not regulation. Charities are already subject to high levels of regulation. Um, we don't need a separate police force just for charities. And that is a very quick whistle stop um, run through that, but hopefully I'm not too far over time. <laughs>